um, briefly, as rangers, I think uh, we have a very direct and long-term commitment towards the environment, and I think to some extent people as well. Um, the Mosaic Project uh, focuses on people, and particularly urban communities, ethnic minority urban communities, and their use of the national park. Um, the Hindu and Indian Cultural and Spiritual Organization, or Hindu Samaj, um, call it that here on, it's easier to say that, is what you might think to be an unlikely environmental organization, but only on the face of it. Um, let me explain. So, Hindu scriptures uh, propound a sort of Gaia theory of the world, so holistic perception of the world, uh, not a position of domination for man over environment. So it is um, that that the Hindu Samaj brings to the project, and uh, through this project it hopes to encourage its urban clientele to connect with the environment as well. So through this project, the Samaj can go beyond its merely practical role for the community through celebrations of festivals, ritual service, etc., and connect the community to its deep philosophical roots. So, um, for those of you who are familiar with the Mosaic uh, project, this project is in a way quite different from the Mosaic type activities that we've done before, uh, which have mainly been about increasing well-being um, through activities like cycling, walking, climbing, uh, and other adventurous activities in the National Park. What this project seeks to do is to um, uh, move towards a position where the Indian community can take leadership roles in shaping the environmental agenda. So, for example, by seeking out cotton links between uh, industry in the Peak District during colonial times between India and the UK, we are seeking to create awareness and also develop a position on trade and the environment. Now, by delving into Carpenter's simplification of life, as he called it himself, and his spirituality, we are questioning the rationality of the uh, consumerist practices and its impact on the environment. So, overall, this project then is about developing a vibrant, multicultural community at the interface of the countryside and urbanity. Urbanity is actually a word. This word doesn't give me a squiggle under it, so I take it that it's actually a really wor um, a word. I don't know, I actually didn't know that, I even knew that word until I tucked in and it didn't show me squiggles. <laughs> so, okay, that's the project. Uh, the project is called the uh, British Raj in the Peak District. Can you turn to that slide show? called uh, British Raj in the Pig District. It's funded through uh, the All Our Stories scheme of a heritage lottery. Uh, the University of Sheffield um, has been a key partner in this project, providing us with expertise, space and resources. Uh, the second key partner is the Ranger Service, so my thinking behind this project is largely from uh, the Ranger side of my brain. There's anything like that. <laughs> Tom and Terry and the others who are present here um, are going to have their input. Uh, Tom helped me with uh, doing the route that we did at Millthorpe. So it's he who's responsible for feeding us to the cows. So you can talk to him about that. Um, so we started this project around December 2012. Uh, we knew about the fact that we got the money in November. We started off in December, quite sluggishly at that time. Um, we had to put together a sort of steering group, be very democratic about it, um, talk to people, and uh, so we got this whole big massive group. You can actually see a lot of it on our blog, which is right there at the bottom. I'm sure all of you had emails from me with that sort of blog, now it's kind of, you know, intercribed in your memory, I'm sure. Um, so you, you'll see a lot more details about who, who is uh, steering this project, etc., on the blog. Um, we, fin uh, we hope to finish it in December 2013. I think there'll be a big gala party, won't it? With the university's uh, all our stories projects all uh, coming together. January. January. January 17th. January 17th. Oh, brilliant. Okay, you've got the date then. January 17th. Make sure you put that in your diary. Is it going to be fireworks or anything? Perhaps not fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really not friendly. <laughs> um, but we have um, um, our sort of last event, which will be an exhibition for our project in November 2013, which will be our sort of big one. And after that, I have to be right in thoughts. Anyone help me with that? Great. <laughs> so, and it's been a very, very busy time. Um, now, before I go any further, uh, you've all had a look at the uh, program. So, my idea was to just introduce 
the actual findings of the project, which I will do as briefly as I can. There's a lot more information on the blogs if you want to go into the details, right? Um, and after that, you know, we, I don't want to keep talking and sort of discuss uh, talking to you most of the time. So that's the only part where I'm sort of going to be giving information. After that, we'll sort of have a little break. And the main part and the fun part is where we break out into groups and start actually putting all that information um, into what groups and um, decide what we're going to do in, you know, in the future as far as um, working in the National Park is concerned. Right? So that's sort of the breakdown of the day. Um, so we'll see if we can catch up in terms of time. I might cut my presentation a short, short a little bit. So basically, there have been three types of activities on this project so far. Um, one where we've heard from experts. Uh, this has been through a series of talks about colonial history, the background behind cotton, international trade, um, about Edward Carpenter, um, uh, all during 18th, 19th, uh, early 20th century. Uh, that's the first type of activity. The second has been hands-on research. Uh, many of our project researchers are here in this room today. Um, none of us had actually been to Sheffield Archives before. Uh, we had a bit of training on how to use the archives and to do research. Uh, we were particularly interested in the Carpenter Collection at Sheffield Archives, which is the largest in the world. Um, our call actually was uh, that we could see Gandhi's original letters, Mahatma Gandhi's original letters at Sheffield Archives and we discovered there was one letter from Mahatma Gandhi. It was more like a short note, really. Um, but it was, it was just really interesting, because we'd otherwise only kind of see it behind glass, ca uh, glass cabinets and museums, if you've had in India, you know, a letter from Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the third type of activity has been outdoors. Um, we've had uh, many day trips and uh, walks in the National Park and, it, and the surrounding areas. So we did um, leak on sort of that um, southern side, and then we did um, southwestern, southeastern. We went to Cromford Mills, a World Heritage site. Um, then we were at Arlem, and we were at Bakewell, and we've been Millbrook, and a little bit on sort of closer to where we are now. So that's the sort of day trips we've had uh, since I think we did it from May was our first trip. May was the first trip, and the last one was 27th. July. So, uh, um, and it's, it's, been, it's been great. Um, we've got tons of pictures and tons of videos, and we're just going to show you a quick sample of a few. Um, there's, there's a lot of pictures and all that on the blog for you to um, have a look. So, there's a video if I visit for the sort of
This is just for the August audience present over here. So quite a, it was, I think it, it had rained two, three days before when we went on the walk. So quite a slushy road and we had to walk on both sides of the wet path that is there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've kept the videos for a short, this one, for you know, engaging Do you want to go to the yeah, most uh, interesting part of the movement? <laughs> <laughs> one of the interesting bits was facing the cars <laughs> here. I, this is not the interesting bit, but this was just a so preview of what was going on next. The the after some time. After a pleasant surprise, we went on to a kind of a farm actually that was, you know, and it, this was around 7.30 or 8.30 p.m. in the evening, and we ran into this field where there were hundreds of cows, and show that.
we're still working through a lot of the film, really. Um, we've got lots of rough footage, but it used to break. Okay, so just a sample of the type of activities we did. Um, so let me um, then go on to give you the um, findings from our sort of two main teams. Um, we started the project trying to look at what the industrial links uh, would be between uh, the Peak District and India. So we, uh, upon advice from our um, history expert, um, who's, uh, who's a lecturer at the University of Sheffield, we decided we'd look at cotton mills. Um, and we had a PhD student who worked for us doing a bit of research, not very much at all, but um, you know, we didn't have that much time. But we just wanted to get a flavour of what the links might be like. Um, so this workshop, uh, Threads of Cotton, a workshop on the history of cotton in the Peak District, uh, was held on the 13th of April at the University, uh, exploring the history of processing Indian cotton in mills in the Peak District. Now the morning session covered Carver Mill, a connection to India, uh, which was prefaced by an introduction to the historical context of cotton and cotton fabric as a global commodity from India for the last 5,000 years. Uh, cotton foundations of colonialism and the deindustrialization of cotton production in India, leading to the loss of access to global mar uh, markets. Uh, the patented invention of the spinning jenny by James Watt in the 18th century, and also changes in the labor law and society in Derbyshire during the Industrial Revolution. So we took in a lot of different strands as a background, really, to uh, the places we were visiting and the people we, are, we were looking at in the Peak District. Um, and we also had a morning session where uh, we had uh, remarkable oral history stories from on cotton from India and England that emerged from the community, uh, touching on all the about themes. The afternoon session uh, featured uh, presentations on the life and achievements of Sir Richard Arkwright and also a critical look at the patents that he held and lost within a 10 year span, which were central to his success and fortune. The sessions actually drew attention to the national amnesia prevalent in the history of the empire and provided interesting information that will help rethink the places that we visit in the Peak District National Park. This is sort of what we were looking for um, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the workshop. <coughs> so what's the Carver, what's the Indian connection to Carver Mill? Um, so uh, now I think it's a set of private flats called Riverside Court Flats. Um, in Carver, in the National Park. It was once a cotton mill along the River Derbent and used the latest cotton spinning technology uh, that was licensed from Richard Arkwright, uh, owner of Cromford Mill, which we went to look at, and also the father or the pioneer of the Industrial Revolution. This mill was established in 1778 um, and functioned as a cotton mill using water power till about 1923. A Carver mill is located um, in quite a scenic area, um, I won't go into that because you'll be looking at maps later on. Now, between 1860, no, um, so the records we looked at, or the PhD research we looked at, are at Derbyshire Record Office at Matlock, and she looked at the period 1868 to 1877. Um, so, Carver Mill received supplies of cotton from various cotton growing regions in India. Cotton came to Liverpool via ship from the coasts of India and were sold at the cotton exchange in Liverpool. Now, this cotton from India was rated quite highly and sold for quite high prices, comparable to the best cotton available at that time. Uh, Indian producers competed with American producers for supplying cotton. With the technology uh, that was revolutionized by Richard Arkwright's patented spinning frame, carding machine, and the factory system, the mills in uh, England and the Peak District were ever hungry for uh, more cotton to process. They were sourcing it from as many places as they could. Now, cotton used at Carver Mill came from Western Madras, currently in the state of uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, possibly from the two uh, growing areas of Coimbatore and Salem. It so happens that that's where my parents live at the moment. It's just a bit of information I'm going to take back to them this summer and probably go and look at some of the stuff over there just to see. Where, um, uh, whether they have records about having sent something across here, that is if I have the time, after all the family. Um, and it, uh, cotton also came from the state of Gujarat, uh, from places such as Surat and Broch. In uh, April 1868, Carver Mill received about 1772 pounds of cotton from Western Madras at a price of 9 and 1 fourth 
D. Now, I don't know what exactly that term is. If anyone knows what that you know, D means, it's the old penny. Ah, okay. So we just call it the penny then. Let me read it. Oh, okay. okay. So nine and quarter penny then. Um, in uh, December 1868, uh, received uh, bales of cotton from Surat. I can actually go on with the numbers, but you get the idea, I think. Um, so, in comparison to um, sort of the, uh, the other cotton that was received from other parts, cotton received from other parts of the world, um, the, the prices of cotton grown in India vary somewhere between four dimes to nine and quarter dimes. Um, nine, I think the highest uh, price that American cotton fetched at the same time was a little over ten dimes. Now what's interesting is if you put the context within which the growers from these two regions actually uh, produce their cotton. Um, I'll tell you about that in a bit. But um, publications from that time discuss the differences between the character of the cottons of the East and the West. So American and India. It's interesting to note that the meaning of superior and inferior varieties of cotton of the day um, and how that superior and inferior criteria was set. Now, inferiority of surat or Indian cotton consisted in its want of length, apparently, was highly appreciated in terms of its fineness and strength. Um, and according to expert opinion, um, we, we read in one of the sources, if properly cleaned and carefully cultivated, uh, must always hear a fair competition in the English market with the New Orleans and upper, Upland Georgia cottons, um, which are grown in uh, southern states of the American Union. So to put it in context as to um, the, you know, the growing conditions in America, the, the sort of um, tough laws that um, they face in, sort of, you know, um, in India in comparison, and given the fact that despite all this, they were still selling at high prices, I've got a little extract from uh, a presentation that was made in 1839, which doesn't seem to have changed in 1868 either, um, at the Asiatic Society. So here it goes. It's a quote. Um, there can be no question, therefore, that under common circumstances, England might get all its cotton from India. But that country is not placed in ordinary circumstances as compared with the rest of the world. Firstly, it has an overflowing and naturally industrious population with millions of acres of uncultivated soil on which the government imposes a tax so onerous that the inhabitants cannot cultivate it and thrive. Secondly, it has a system of imports on the raw produce of that soil where it is raised, which prevents its finding a profitable market. And thirdly, there are few and no means of transporting the raw produce for want of roads, which the people who are heavily taxed are unable um, by themselves to construct. It's just a context, um, the, the sort of colonial political context within which the trade was actually happening. Okay, so that's really sort of brief of the findings that we had in cotton. Now, all this information is just, you know, for your information to give you context. What we're going to do today in terms of practical um, things is, you know, we're going to get all this information, fill it as we uh, do the kind of work, but for doing the route, not really relevant, but it's just a good bit of information for, uh, for findings. Now, some of the interesting questions that we thought we uh, could do further research on, but not within the remit of this project, is who were the merchants from Western Madras or Surat or Broch that sold the cotton? Which port uh, in India did it come out of? Which ships brought the cotton to Liverpool? Uh, someone told us about the Lloyd's shipping list, which we could look at to um, look at which ships exactly brought the cotton. Which farms were involved in growing cotton? Who managed carbon mill during that time? Did they travel to India, perhaps? Um, what was the trading system during that time? Did they procure any credit? Um, did people in the villages in Peak District uh, wear any Indian cotton? Really interesting questions, but something that uh, will take us more time um, to work on. One of the other things that we also discovered uh, was that there was a project around carbon beer um, uh, which is close to carbon milk, so the uh, water that came into uh, uh, the mill and it was producing cotton would have come through this. Um, there's a big uh, heritage project that, um, that's gone around the restoration of uh, carbon milk, which has got some interesting uh, information on their website, and they've also been looking at um, the mill itself and some of the work. Uh, so uh, one of the things we also want to do is to have a chat with um, uh, the carbon milk restoration group. 
Right. Okay. So that's about the cotton groups on the cotton theme. Um, during the project, uh, one of the volunteer rangers contacted me and said, "Oh, there's some interesting links with silk that we've been uh, that we have um, uncovered." And I'll give you a brief um, um, idea of what it is because it's a very direct heritage link uh, to silk. And uh, Mike here is going to talk more about that. But I'm going to just say a few words um, about what we found. Um, so. Um, on one of our day trips, we went up to Leek and we saw this embroidery exhibition, which was all about um, somebody called Sir Thomas Warden, who uh, developed methods for dyeing Indian silk. And he travelled to India, worked a lot in India, and his wife set up uh, an embroidery society, sort of works, stitches, um, that will bring out the sheen and the characteristic of this um, silk, uh, stussa silk, uh, happens to be called, and it's actually even used uh, up to today. Um, so that was the um, sort of link that um, was presented to us. Um, it was not cotton, but another commodity, silk, and probably um, another, and, and quite a strong uh, link to um, India. So I'll leave, leave it at that, and uh, Mike will pick up a little bit more about uh, how that's significant in the National Park. So that's the cotton route, silk route, and last but not least is uh, carpenter. And this is the sort of last theme that we've worked on. Um, so Edward Carpenter was uh, lived between 1848 and 1929, so uh, 84, 85 years old when he passed away. And he was a socialist and an environmentalist. He made and um, uh, wore sandals and tripped across the Pig District in sandals, and he sort of lived in, after the cold winter, which he, which he said, you know, uh, helped him toughen himself up and also understand what nature is about. He was very keen to experiment in all sorts of ways. Um, and he was a sort of a global person, we find, and he's kind of very progressive for his time. Um, he travelled to America, met Walt, uh, Walt Whitman, and lots of literary, uh, political personalities of the time. Um, he and Foster stayed at his house, and uh, on the eastern side, um, he's travelled to India and Sri Lanka, he's written a travelogue, and he has, um, he was very interested in the uh, spirituality, the spiritual ideas of Hinduism, and uh, then, you know, since he comes back, I think he was there, 1891, he uses that in his sort of socialist pamphlets, in his idea of living with nature, etc. And he's sort of had a correspondence with um, uh, lots of famous Indian personalities. Um, the list is actually quite long. Um, we, we went into the archives thinking we'd probably find some letters from Mahatma Gandhi, and probably we thought Mahatma Gandhi was talking to him about his ashram life and vegetarianism and things like that. Um, but all of that is there in the letters, but from lots of different people, not from Mahatma Gandhi actually. Um, he's, um, he's received the first translation of the sort of world famous. Um, uh, 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 the first literary a Nobel Prize winner, Rabindranath Tagore, and the work that he did, Gitanjali, was first was translated from the native Bengali into English and sent first to uh, Carpenter here. And that letter is actually there in the archives. Um, he wrote to um, uh, Annie Besant, who was head of the Theosophical, the World Theosophical Movement, which is again sort of this political, spiritual movement was, you know, based in Indian spirituality, but also advocated a freedom for um, India. And um, other personalities that are perhaps not so familiar um, with us, but those people held you know, high positions and uh, status in society. So there was Vishwanath Singh, who was a Maharaja of Chattarpur, um, whose letters are, you know, quite a lot of letters in the archives from him. Um, Ponnamalam Arunachalam, who uh, was a classmate of Edward Carpenter and later on went on to become the Chief Justice um, in. Uh, uh, of, the, of the Supreme Court in uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, other people, um, some funny letters as well um, in there. So there was one letter from somebody that Carpenter met when he was in India called Panalal Gordon. He sets up a circus in India, and then he writes to Carpenter saying, can you send me some animal training manuals <laughs> across? <laughs> so he's wondering about the poor animals and himself without, before he got the training manual. <laughs> Was just, uh, he seems to have got letters from literally all strata of society across all age groups. Just a really interesting, you 
particular character who I think people felt listened uh, to them quite a bit. So very, very colourful. And the language, of course, is from that period. Um, not very politically correct and all that, but it just makes for very, very interesting reading once you get through some of the you know, handwriting issues that you come across. Um, right, so I'll go straight into the bits that are relevant for uh, practical activity afterwards. So this is where you, you probably want to get your pen and papers out and make sure you note down the information because you're going to have to use the information to draw up roots. Um, there's one obedient student there. <laughs> so Carpenter's Walks. So we did a little bit of work on, very little bit of work, but we seem to have found some interesting bits of information. Um, we wanted to look at where Carpenter actually walks in the National Park. But remember he passed away in 1929 and he was only in Mill Park until 1922. By that time, so we are talking somewhere 15 years before the uh, King of Tespers, and we're talking um, quite a few years before the National Park was set up in 1951, right? So all these areas would have you know, later on fallen within the boundaries of the National Park. So we sort of um, pick up information that uh, are like that. So I'm just going to give you three bits. One, um, nothing about the route, but uh, we read somewhere that he would take lung bursting walks across the peaks in Sandwich, um and preach vegetarianism a respect for nature and the need for all fellow travellers on the left um, to the capital L to find common ground and unity. That's one. Um, here's one which is a more of a route uh, thing. On Marathon Trek on Easter Sunday in 1895, um, Alf Mattison came over with three of his Leeds comrades. Carpenter used to lecture in Leeds before he came on to Sheffield and then moved on to Milford. Um, Adams and Carpenter went to Hadisich for Dora Toddy Station where they picked up the colleagues from Leeds. The following day they walked down the river Derwent through Grindleford and Bamford, which must have caused a minor stir as they were singing and giving out leaflets. Then they climbed up the shivering mountain, Mount Tor, which lived up to its name. They were caught in freezing hail before arriving back to Milk Park. So that's one long Route, I think. Yeah. Um, then uh, something very short, it's quite cryptic actually, this one, with Merrill, um, who was Carpenter's partner and lover. Carpenter at last could enjoy angst free pleasure. Carpenter took another Pied A Terra, I think it's a French word for another house, in Sheffield, that 56 Global Road, and the two men stayed there or accompanied one another on long walks over the moors. I don't know. Uh, we have to figure out which moors this might be, and if they had sort of walked from 56 Glover Road in Sheffield, which we check still exists, um, might be uh, something to find out which moors and which route they might have taken, etc. But that's something to think about. Okay, so that's really about the um, carbon findings in the carpet of roads. I think with that, I'll probably stop. Any questions? Any doubts?